You would stand with me this morning as we read God's Word together. I want you to really pay attention to the words because I know that there are people here this morning that are going to identify with the people in this text. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized, he asked them. Into John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe the one who would come after him that is, in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other tongues and to prophesy. And now there were about twelve men in all. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we just are thankful and grateful that everything that we know of you is not everything there is to know of you. God, I just pray for those here today that don't, they, th they think that all they know of you is all there is to know. God, I just pray for those this morning that they think that you don't love them because they're struggling or that you're not real because they've been hurt. That this morning that they would understand who you are in full. Father, that you would put their feet on high places today. That they would understand through your Holy Spirit as they embrace you that the pathway to high places, Father, is not paved, but it's rocky. But Father, I pray that the joy of the Holy Spirit would fill this place. Father, that what we see in part and know in part that you would complete today. Father, that like that mighty wind, you would come in today through the Holy Spirit and that Father David would, that he would lay his spiritual hands on us today, that we may receive your Holy Spirit. And Father, there's somebody here this morning that doesn't know there is a Holy Spirit. And today I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would be real to them, that you would flood them, that you would lead them into all truth. Father, touch our hearts today as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So back when I was, I guess I was about 20 years old, I was feeding cows one day, and I was, I was feeding them. I had sacks of feed, and I was just pouring out. Um, it was cold, and I was just pouring out just a line of feed, and I would get empty, one sack empty. I'd pick another sack up, rip it open, and start going on just a long line. And, um, you know, cows, their brain is this real small. I mean, they can really do some stupid stuff, you know, like they all want to get up to the front of the line because like, they think if they get to the front of the line, I guess they're going to get more feed or gonna better feed or something like that. <clears throat> well, as I was feeding them, the bull decided he wanted to get to the front of the line. That was a Brangus bull, about 2,000 pounds. He came around to the front of the line. I just opened up a new sack, and I was, I was holding the sack like this, and I was feeding, and he had come he'd, he'd, right there while I was pouring it out. He was got right under that area right there, and he very gently decided that he wanted to but the sack that I was holding. And so, you know, I saw him. It was real gentle. It wasn't real aggressive. It wasn't real fast. I was holding it. And so I was a little agitated with him for doing that. So I went to brace myself and brace against him. And there was no match for the power <laughs> that came. I mean, I was amazed at how powerful and how hard his skull was. I mean, he sent me airborne just gently in a nice way. And I had a, it was, it was a gentle power that I would never forget and that I would respect. And so when we talk about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, it is a gentle power that once that power gets close to you and even touches you in the, the least little bit, it will change you and transform you, but you will have a whole new respect for that power. Look at this. this. We're in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. This is kind of like our primary verse. It says, but, when, but you will receive power. Let me ask you this morning, have you received power of the Holy Spirit in your life? The transforming, the life transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Is it something that you have experienced in your life? 
So I'm fortunate to have an artist in my house. Aston drew this for us to help me illustrate this for you this morning. So you think about how the power comes into your house. So think about this. Electricity has the power to transform your house. If we, we lost power here in this room right now, in this building, it would transform the room, right? I mean, we'd go to the shadows, we'd go to darkness, and it would be, you know, many of us would be, you know, the air conditioning and ventilating and all that kind of stuff. It would drastically change. You think about this. If you remember, what was it, I can't remember, it was a year ago or something like that when the snowstorm hit and we lost electricity and many of us lost water and all that. I mean, like, it transformed the way we lived for a few days or a week or so, right? Well, the electricity into your house, see, here's the situation. You can decide if you want to just by flipping a breaker if you want to shut off power to a room. And then also, if power starts going and it gets all messed up out in the house and it comes back, it'll trip the breaker itself and you no longer have power to that room. Now, if we got the power of the Holy Spirit coming into our life and it's empowering every aspect of our life, see, that's what you have to understand this morning. It is. If you're in Christ, say, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, then the Holy Spirit is empowering every aspect of your life. And so if, if I decide that, you know, I just want to, the Holy Spirit to only work in certain areas of my life, and I start flipping off breakers, I say, hey, as far as entertainment is concerned, I'm just going to flip. I don't want the Holy Spirit messing with that part of my life. Here's the amazing thing, is that the Holy Spirit is so powerful and so gentle that he will allow you to do that. However, there will be consequences. It's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. Some of you right now, I mean, listen, I know with this many people sitting in this room, and I know we got people watching online, I know that for some of you right now, you have got conviction of the Holy Spirit. Some of you, you may not even want to be in this room. And you may, I mean, the conviction may be bothering you so much, you may be like, man, I sure hope I don't get outed in here. Well, good news, you won't. Not by us, anyway. Now, you may be outed by the Holy Spirit. So, we can... The Holy Spirit will allow us to do this. So if you're saying, I'm in Christ, I'm a Christian, but I just won't, I don't want God in this area of my life, here's the amazing thing. God will not come forcing himself in. He will gently convict with this gentle power. And, but if he does so choose to, he will invade. He can do that, and he will do that. The, the Holy Spirit's in, it, he is it's not an it. That's right. It's a he. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So as we talk about the life-transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we struggle today in Christianity with this. If you go back to the Old Testament, the manifest presence of God was at the tabernacle at the very beginning. The whole nation of Israel would get in these tribes around the tabernacle with a, their, their opening of their tent facing towards the tabernacle, and their whole life was lived around the glory and the presence of God. Man, I mean, that's, that's what their life, that dictated their life, the glory and the presence of God. In the tabernacle. Now, you come to the New Testament, and it says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? See, many of you, if you grew up in church, when you're in a youth group, you heard that verse right there saying, don't drink, don't do drugs, don't do this, because this, and that's not, I mean, yeah, we shouldn't be doing that. That's not what this verse is about. This verse is about the manifest presence of God is living in you. You that are in Christ. I mean, that is an amazing truth to try to behold. To say that this the all-powerful God that spoke everything into creation has decided to make his dwelling in you. <laughs> How could that not transform us? Uh, because we're flipping a bunch of breakers off. Scared? Nope. And I mean, some of you right now, you're like, oh, Lord, that Holy Spirit, we're talking about prophecy and tongues, all that goofy stuff. And the Holy Spirit, I mean, for many people in, in church, it's kind of like that crazy uncle that shows up and you don't know what he's going to bring. But I'm just wondering this morning, you know, don't think about the people sitting around you. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering this morning for you. You and I just sitting across the table from one another. How do you view the Holy Spirit? How is the Holy Spirit 
transforming you right here and right now. Barney Group did a study on people that go to church, Christians that go to church. And they, they, this is what they said. About 60 church-going Christians, 60% of church-going Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is a symbol of God's power or presence, but is not a living entity. <laughs> what do we do with that? Because, you know, the Bible, if we say, okay, I'm going to follow what the Bible says, then it has got some, in and of myself, it has got some impossible commands that I cannot fulfill. Let me show you a few. Always be humble and gentle. Were you here last week? <laughs> Can't do that on our own. Rejoice always. Really? In and of myself, I can't rejoice always. I mean, there are some rough circumstances that we, fit, we, we face in this life. Some trauma, overwhelming to say, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, even when everything is falling apart, when death, disease, crushing us, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In and of myself, I cannot do this. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, that is impossible. Let me show you a few more. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. You tried that one yet? That's a tough one in and of yourself. Here's the problem. Listen, I know some of y'all here, you got this one nailed. This is no problem for you. Here's, <laughs> but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm. That doesn't just come natural to us, does it? So then when we've got 60% today of church going Bible-believing, so to speak, Christians that say they, they don't even believe that the Holy Spirit is, is a real, I mean, what do we do with that? See, then, then it comes in, then what happens is, is that we move over into what's called behavior modification. This is not you doing your best, okay? you go out and you de- love your enemies. And you may, you may be able to do that for an hour or a few minutes or something like that. But then that flesh is going to take over, and then you can't do it in and of yourself. And then what happens? Then the self-condemnation comes rushing in. I must be a terrible Christian because I can't do this. And I'm telling you, you can't. You can't do it. It's time for you to be set free. This isn't you doing it. It's a transforming power of the Holy Spirit that's doing something in you that you cannot do. But see, you've got to flip the breakers back on. If you, don't, if you don't flip those breakers back on, and you stay in the shadows, and you revel there in your anger and your unforgiveness or whatever it may be, and in your sin, then I can promise you this much. You will never experience that life-transforming power of the Holy Spirit. You will be left in there, there in that condemnation wondering, what is wrong with me? Why am I not a good Christian? See, there's something that has went wrong in our culture that's happened over the last 50 years or 100 years to where we have got to the place to where church is about living your best life now, being the best version of you, and all the focus comes on to me, myself and I, and me being better, me getting something better from God, And our focus has moved away from God Almighty. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We've got 60%. That's not alarming to you. 60% not even really believing in the Holy Spirit. But how could you get to that 60%? Because we stopped teaching theology. We stopped teaching the Bible. Here's our text this morning. Yeah, I know, I know this morning that it is Palm Sunday, by the way. And I wanted to preach that Palm Sunday text, by the way. Really, I got the text out, man. I was getting it, I was loading it up and everything, and the Holy Spirit was saying, no, no, no. And I kept on trying to do it. And so this morning, we're in Acts. We're going to keep on going through Acts. So while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some, remember he left, if you remember this, he left Ephesus on his last, his second journey. And he, he wanted to stay there and they're like, please stay with us. And he said, well, I'm gonna, I gotta go home, but Lord willing, I'll come back. Look at this. 
he made his way back. He's back in Ephesus once again. And when he got there, the church, now, listen, it's multiplying, it's growing, and he found some disciples there. And he asked them, <laughs> I mean, could you imagine this? He comes walking in there, and here's the disciples. The first question out of his mouth is, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why is that important? Because whenever you believe, you say, you say this morning, say, listen, I'm saved. Then that means that when you are saved, the Holy Spirit enters your life. The, the Bible terminology is baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not everybody speaks in tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit happens to all of us at salvation. Immersion of the Holy Spirit, filling us right there, cleansing us. I have never spoken in tongues, but I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit right now. Never spoken in tongues. Listen, if you've spoken in tongues, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm not saying diminishing that in any way, but I'm just saying that being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily mean you manifest any of the sign gifts. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not manifest a sign gift. As wonderful, as beautiful as those are. Listen, if you've got those, praise God, happy for you. Listen, our stance, the elders of this church, we, do, we, do, we are non-sensationalists. That means we do not believe in the, sensa- the cessation, the stopping of the sign gifts. However, none of us are going to have the gift of interpretation. So you're not going to come into this church. You're going to have people getting up, speaking in tongues, and we're going to be interpreting that. We don't do that as a corporate family, okay? So, but I want to say, we're not saying that those have ceased and they're not of value and you don't have them. We're saying that as a corporate body, we don't exercise these things. So here he is. He said, had, no, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, look at this. Titus 3, 5. He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we have done. Not the good works that we, not that we can work our way into salvation. But according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration, that means making something brand new, and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. So how important is the Holy Spirit in your salvation? It is essential. So he said, then what until have you been baptized? To what then were you baptized, he asked them. Into John's, John the Baptist. Into John's baptism, they replied. No, this is 30 years earlier. John the Baptist was executed about 30 years. So here we got 30 years later, we got this group in Ephesus that's saying that they, you know, that they're disciples. But whenever Paul asked them to come in there, he said, have you been, received the Holy Spirit? Man, we didn't even know there was such a thing. Totally, listen, not that they've been misinformed, but they've not been fully informed. Okay? Uh, th- this is, you know, this is not on them. I mean, they didn't like, this wasn't some intentional heresy that they got into. They just hadn't been fully informed that there was. They only got as far as John the Baptist was concerned. Now, how, let me ask you this. I mean, we talk about how important the Holy Spirit is, and let's talk about this. How important to you is a death, burial, the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> you take that away, we're in trouble, Right? I mean, we've been talking about this for the last several weeks. How important this is Holy Week we're coming into right now. Man, I mean, that the next, next Resurrection Sunday is it for us. It is the Sunday of the year for us. And we'll be in Acts still, just by, by the way. But it doesn't diminish what this means to us. It is the, listen, without this isn't even about with you when you die being resurrected and going into heaven and all that. It's about you living the resurrected life right here and right now. We'll talk about that more next Sunday. Paul said, okay, let's get this straight. John baptized, John the Baptist baptized you with a baptism of repentance. Now, what John the Baptist is doing is he was coming to the Jewish nation and he was preaching repentance. He was asking them to repent from what they thought from being born in a Jewish people of them being in the kingdom of God and to repent from that and their sins and to get ready for the Messiah. Now, who is the Messiah? It's Jesus, right? So getting ready, repenting of sin, and getting ready for the Messiah to save us. 
telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. So he makes it clear, this is it. Jesus is the Messiah. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And here's, here's the interesting thing. This past week as I was studying this text, I wondered why, when Paul got there and they said, we've been baptized in John's baptism, that is by immersion. Uh, you, you, will, you will see here, you'll see Savannah get baptized by immersion here in a little bit at the end of our service. So they were baptized by immersion in the water. So why didn't the apostle Paul go, oh, well, good, you've been baptized by immersion, that's good enough. Okay, so let me tell you about Jesus. No, no, look at this. When they heard this, they were baptized, I got it highlighted, into the name. Why is that important? Because the name of Jesus is what carries the authority of Jesus. Amen. So when they were baptized into the name of Jesus, then they were baptized into the authority kingdom rule of Jesus. He, now listen, they're baptized, when you're baptized into Jesus, then you're baptized into the king's kingdom. Does that make sense? The king of the kingdom. You're baptized into his authority. So now, they're coming under the authority, rule, and reign of Jesus in their life. When you see Savannah, when she gets baptized here in a moment, listen, it's not for the washing away of sins. The, her, her baptism is not going to save her. The baptism right here, though, is a baptism into the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom authority rule of Jesus over her life. It is a symbol, but yet it's so much more. Don't diminish what's about to happen here in a moment and think it's just a symbol. It is a powerful, wonderful, beautiful thing. It's like when we take communion. We'll take communion in a moment too. It's not just you eating a wafer and drinking some grape juice. It is you communing with the Lord. Listen, if I came to you and I said, hey, let's go out here in the church, church parking lot and stand there and let's talk for one hour today. I'll meet you back up here at whatever time. You might say, okay, great. Go talk to David for an hour. <laughs> let's see him talk enough already. But what if I said now that I wanted to invite you over to my home for dinner? Or what if I said I'll meet you at your favorite restaurant and pay for your meal? And we sit down and we ate the meal together. Would that be different? It's very different, isn't it? So when we go to baptism, it's not just a religious exercise. When we share in communion, it's us communing with the Lord. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And so right here, when they're baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, they weren't just like, okay, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and get baptized in, whatever. Man, they immediately obeyed, and it was something that was significant and important to Paul and to them. So don't think it's no big deal. I mean, if you're sitting here today and you're like, ah, you know, I believe in Jesus, but I've never been baptized, you're missing out on a beautiful, wonderful gift. And when Paul had laid his hands on him, on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And that scares most of y'all in here right now, by the way. I know it does. Because here, here's the thing, and there are about 12 men in all. There's a whole other sermon right there, that whole 12 men right there, but we got to just let that one go. Can't chase that rabbit today. But, but here, here's the thing. In evangelical Christianity, which like the, the, the vein I grew up in of evangelical Christianity, it's like we push so hard against charismatic church and so hard against Roman Catholicism that we lost the value of this. We lost the value of baptism, and we lost the value of the Holy Spirit. We're now, oh, can we calm down? We've got 60% of Christians in America today that don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. So we've got to be careful when you disagree with something to push so far back into rebellion that we lose the value of it. So when I when we've been in the book of Acts for over a year now, I know we've got about another year or so to go. <laughs> but some of the people were like, man, you're gonna do this? I mean, like, all that tongue talking in Acts? 
Okay, so is it, is it really? Is it loaded with people speaking in tongues in the book of Acts? So there's three times right here we see groups of people speaking in tongues. Day of Pentecost, the 12 apostles and all people gathered there, what the audience, unsaved Jews, relation to salvation after salvation, the purpose to validate for the Jews the fulfillment of prophecy out of the Old Testament book of Joel chapter 2. Then you've got Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter goes there, and these are saved Jews and Peter's and others who doubted God's plan. That's the audience. The, the, the related to salvation, same time as salvation, the purpose to validate for the Jews God's acceptance of Gentiles. And then here, about 12 Old Testament believers because they would be considered Old Testament believers because they were following John's baptism. John is the last Old Testament prophet even though you read of him in the New Testament because it's before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And who's honest, the Jews who needed to confirm the message Ready to salvation, the same time of salvation, the purpose to validate, to validate, to validate for the Jews, Paul's message. Now, is it all loaded down with it? No. Is there a reason for all of it? Yes. Absolutely there is. So look at this, church. Galatians chapter 5. The sinful nature that you've got inside of you as a Christian wants to do evil. There's the good news which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. you got this battle going on inside of you. And the Spirit gives us the desire that are opposed of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Can anybody say amen to the church this morning? But when you are directed by the Spirit, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results, here's what happens. They're very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Any of y'all experienced that this morning getting ready for church? Selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Interesting terminology right here. See, we would think, we'd say, okay, so anybody doing that wouldn't go to heaven. That isn't what he says. It says anybody doing that will not inherit Interesting word, inherit the kingdom of God. So in their culture, in their time, they lived a little differently than we do. Back in their day, whenever, see, there was a patriarch of the family, and he was the, he, he owned all the land and all the houses. He was a patriarch. You, listen, when your dad was alive, you lived in his house. You might have built onto his house, but you're in his house. You're under his authority rule. As long as he's alive, he's a patriarch, and you live on his property. You get, a man gets married, what does he do? He goes and gets his bride and brings her. He's built onto his house, and they live there under his authority rule until he passes. So listen, when the son is living there, he's living in his inheritance. He's got it now, he owns it now, and he will get it later in a fulfillment of a greater degree later. Does that make sense? So, so what, what, what Paul's saying right here is like, man, listen, if I've got all, if, if there's no transformation taking place in my life, if I'm still doing all the sins that I did before I made my profession of faith or whatever it was, then there's no evidence that any transformation is taking place in my life, then I'm not inheriting in the future nor right now, the kingdom of God. Palm Sunday, Jesus comes riding in on the donkey into Jerusalem. What is he doing? He is signifying that he is the king, like Jehu did when he rode in to Jerusalem. He is signifying that the king is coming and the kingdom is coming and I'm the king. So let me ask you something. Are you living in the kingdom of God? No, 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 that's the wrong question. The right question is this. Do you want to live in the kingdom of God right here and right now? 
I'm not asking you want to go to heaven when you die. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, you're sitting here in church, probably a yes, solid yes for you. Like, yeah, <laughs> do you want to get to heaven when I die? But I'm asking you this, is heaven coming to you right here and right now? If you say, no, not really, then, then listen, either, you, either you're not, you don't have the power source coming to the breaker box, or you got all the breakers flipped off. A majority of them flipped off. Which one is it? Man, you know what? I've been praying that some of y'all have a Holy Spirit explosion in here this morning. <laughs> Man, I mean, I love that. When you're just going along and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just goes, bam! It just hits you and you're just like, oh, oh, I just start crying, oh God, thank you. Man, I've been praying that that would happen to you. I am sick and tired. Let's just talk, okay? <laughs> now, most of y'all can't see me, but just pretend like you can. I am sick and tired of cold religion in the church. Of just going to church and just going through the motions and just singing songs and just listening to the preacher, nah, 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 doing the religious thing and going home. Sick and tired of it. You know what I mean? Wouldn't it be great that whenever we came together on a Sunday morning that you were anticipating a Holy Spirit explosion in your heart? Yes. I know, you know, some of y'all right now are like, okay, here goes all the creaky, creepy people right now. I kind of freaking out a little bit. I don't want that. And see, I'm praying it's going to happen to you. See, because... Here's the thing, is when it happens to you, it will be the most powerful, frightening thing you ever experienced in your life, and you'll never, ever be the same. Oh, listen, but the fruit, not plural, singular, you can't have one without all of them, because it's the work of the Holy Spirit, not your work, but the fruit, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So this is what God, the Holy Spirit, does through you. You don't do this. You don't work your way into this. This is what the Holy Spirit does in and through you. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ, have you got that? Those who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you belong to Christ Jesus? Yes. Have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. How do you do that? Only through prayer. Man, I, the, I was just wondering, how do you crucify the flesh? How do you do that? i got to be praying. Man, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave his life. And Listen, can you pray that? Can you, can you every single day I'll come before him and I'm just going to say, God, will crucify this, this because this flesh will do nothing but get me in trouble. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I want your spirit. I want all the breakers flipped on, and I want your power coming in and transforming my life every single day. All right, I got three with me. That's good. We're making progress here, brother. I've crucified with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the only happens through prayer. I can't keep in step by behavior. It's not, listen, it's not me being determined. It's me being dependent. It's not me striving, it's, but it's abiding. If I abide in him and he and I, then I'll bear much fruit. Apart from him, I can do nothing. And see, some of y'all burn out. Man, you're like, I did the whole church serving thing. I just want to come and sit here in this church and leave me alone. I have got burnt out before. Let me tell you something. When you got all the breakers flipped on, the Holy Spirit's empowering and transforming your life, and here's what happens. That brings you into your kingdom purpose in your generation, and you have one, by the way. You have a kingdom purpose in your generation. And when you get to that point, you cannot burn out in that. I don't think y'all hearing me right now. You cannot burn out. When you're living in that, 
under the kingdom authority rule of Jesus, and you're living in your kingdom of purpose, or your you cannot cause, it's not you doing it. You can't burn out when it's not your power and your strength. You just listen. My breaker box isn't stressed out today thinking, oh man, I can't get enough power to this house. It's not the breaker box doing it. It's the power coming into the house. All the breaker box has got to do is abide. So all you got to do is just abide. Man, listen, abide in Christ. You don't do that without praying. You need a passion. You really do. You need, you need passion. But let me say something. Here's the thing about prayer. You've got to pray until you want to pray. I see, I see about half of y'all didn't hear me right now, okay? Let me say it again. You've got to keep on praying until you want to pray. See, because some around here say, man, I, don't, I, I try to pray, but I just, man, like, I just pray, and I just feel like it's just bouncing off the ceiling, and I just feel like nothing's really happening right here. Then my advice to you is to pray until you want to pray. And I prayed for five minutes, man. I done prayed over all the missionaries in all the world. I don't know what to pray anymore. Well, let me, let me tell you something. Got good news for you. You go right out of this room, and there's a little resource room over there, and there's a prayer guide right there. Take that prayer guide. That prayer guide will help you pray longer than five minutes. Wild the heart out, pull it up. They got prayers. You can listen to other people pray. Pray until you want to pray. None of us wake up in the morning and say, man, I can't wait to go pray. Maybe a few do. Most of us don't. Ah, okay. okay. I got to confess my sins. I got to renounce. See, renounce is taken to another level, man. I mean, it's just like, totally, it's not just that I'm just like coming to God and saying, yeah, God, I'm agreeing with you. That was a sin. To renounce it means I hate it. I abhor it. I know that it's against you. I know that it's tripping the breakers in my life. It's keeping me from having a close, intimate relationship with you, so I renounce it, and God grant me the power to repent from the sin. See, some of you are like, man, you're in this circle. There's a sin in your life. You can't shake that sin free, and we got a book out there in that resource room called The Bondage Breaker. You need it. Read it. And you may have a hard time reading it. It's slow at the first, and your life may go crazy, but keep on reading. Right. Don't give up. Get somebody to pray for you. They all were wiped out last week. We've got 20 more. A few of them are already going right now. Get If you haven't got one, get I promise you. you will. I, no one's came back to me and said, I hated that book. <laughs> People came back to me and said, man, I hated that book, but it's the greatest thing I ever did reading it. Yeah. Number three. The only way I'm gonna have the life transforming power of the Holy Spirit is I've got to have passion, I've got to be getting the sin out, and I've got to be living under the kingdom authority rule of Jesus. Man, I'm just seeing Savannah right now getting dunked under that water right there. And you know what, church? Listen, let's just be honest. Let's don't make this another baptism yes. where you're just like, oh wow, that's great, a kid got saved. Look at that. They got wet. Water's going all over the floor. The baptistry's leaking. <laughs> but God, open our spiritual eyes to see what's really happening in this moment. A person is being baptized into your kingdom, rule and authority. It's a beautiful thing. Well, man, I'm out of time. You got your phone. You take a picture of this. I got a few more slides to show you. You can go back, watch it online. That usually comes out on Tuesday, and you can break this down and look at it. The results are being filled. The Spirit, it transforms the way we speak, the way we sing, the way we give thanks, the way we submit to one another, the way we love one another. Oh, man, I want to talk about this right here because it transforms the way you live. You don't live in defeat anymore. You live in victory because Jesus has won the victory. And that's all. Listen, this coming Friday, I don't want, I don't want your expectation gap to crush you on Friday, Okay. Because on Friday, what we're going to come in here, it's going to be a real somber. It's going to be, it's going to be more like a devotional style. When we come together, it's all going to be about the cross and the communion, the tragedy of the cross. But then Sunday morning is going to be the triumph of the cross. It's going to be the resurrection. The king is on his throne. He's ascended the throne. That's going to be celebration time. And listen, if I, we come in here on Friday, all that's going to do is prepare us more for the celebration on Sunday morning. So if you come here Friday night and you're expecting us to have this big blowout fun, yay, yay, raw hot, you're going to be upset. Expectation gap, I'm going to crush you. Oh, man. Maybe next week. Okay. I just dumps. I don't. I'm out of time. It's just. 
Oh, yeah, but we got people back there taking care of our kids. You know, I got to keep them in mind. Bless their hearts. Thank God for them. So once again, you can take pictures of that if you want to take a picture of it. This is how the Holy Spirit makes himself known to us. Um, I'll leave it up there for a second, and then you can watch it online. It'll all be online by Tuesday. Even today it's on there, but you can find it. And the Holy Spirit wants you to know him. Let's just put it that way. Better than you know him now. And I'm the last, listen, you know, in my, I don't know everything about the Holy Spirit by far. <laughs> so much to learn myself. So I'm not getting up here saying that I'm an expert on the Holy Spirit. So let's land this plane. You ready? Let's end where we began. We began with you being filled with the power. The Holy, there's, there's, it's impossible for us to be filled with the power and not be changed. If you say today, I'm a believer in Jesus, then you've got the Holy Spirit. And the question is this, is it changing you? What area of your life have you went over there and tripped off the breaker? And you said, I just want to live in the shadows right here. I don't want anybody to know about this. Hey, listen. The world and the flesh and the devil are working against you in this. The devil's done rewired the house. When we try to turn the power on, it automatically trips the breaker. And we keep going back and trying to trip the breaker on. And we go back and plug it in again. And it, you know what I mean? That means, so sometimes I have to go in and rewire things. Get it all right according to kingdom standard and code. And when you get it like that, then all of a sudden things start working the right way. It's because some of you right now, you've got this private little thing that you think nobody knows anything about that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that no one knows God knows. And what, it's destroying your relationship with God. And you may be doing this, and you're trying to do this, and you're trying to hurt somebody else. Well, let me tell you something. You're not hurting someone else. You're hurting your relationship with God, and you're ultimately hurting yourself. And the Holy Spirit's right now saying, listen, flip on the breaker. Come, let the lights flood this part of your life. Get set free. Yes. So you may be wondering, why are those people clapping right now? Because they got set free. And they, they want you to be set free. And I know some of you, you're clapping on the inside because you can't clap in church because you got set free. That's okay. <laughs> so what is it? Yeah, you already know what it is. And I'm not telling you to tell anybody around you right now, but you know what it is. I'm telling you to bring this to God right now. We're about to take communion. And when we take communion, you need to make sure that everything is good between you and God and everything is good between you and everybody else around you. If there's sin that you're harboring in your life, then you need to confess and repent that. If you're not willing to confess and repent that, then my advice to you is to leave this alone. Nobody's going to judge. Nobody's going to come up to you and say, hey, why didn't you take the Lord's Supper? Well, I, should, I shouldn't say that. They might do that, but they're, they're just the nosy people. But none of us will, the leaders. <laughs> you might have nosy people sitting around you for that. I don't know what to tell you. But anyway... I guess you need to say, because I'm harboring some sin. Let's just be honest, okay? See, some of you, you think, man, I've, you don't know what I've done. It's really bad. And I can tell you this. The Apostle Paul, he was having Christians put to death. You're worse than that? He was going in before his conversion and having Christians put in, thrown in prison, and he was standing there holding the clothes of the people as they assassinated one of the greatest Christians of all time, Stephen. And he watched that, and he never got over it. So listen, don't, don't believe the lie that you've sinned too bad or you think it's too, that God can't forgive you. That is a lie. 
from the pit of hell. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus' blood forgives you of all your sins. So maybe right now in your heart, you need to bring that before the Lord and say, God, I see for the first time that I can be forgiven of this. I believe it. And just pray right now in your heart. Say, God, or maybe you've, see, I know too that some of you, you prayed for forgiveness over that a million times and the guilt and the condemnation is still just, just over your heart. You're like, man, I, I don't feel like God has truly forgiven me. Okay, so let me tell you something. God has truly forgiven you of this, but you have not forgiven yourself. So what you need to be praying is, God, grant me the ability to forgive myself like you've forgiven me. So right now, can you do that in your heart? Just say, God, I just, I can't do it. I can't forgive myself. Would you grant me the ability to forgive myself? Just as you've freely forgiven me. All right, so we've got two bowls at the front. If y'all want to stand up, one at the back. So you can get, once you get your elements, if you don't mind going back and having a seat at your, in your seat, please, I'd appreciate that. That way I know everybody's got their elements. The next day when a large crowd had come to the festival and heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify, this is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. Oh, but then the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're making too much noise. They're embarrassing us. How dare they worship like this? Just added that in. That's my two cents. <laughs> he answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, even the church people would cry out. You know, next Sunday, we're going to see the stone cry out as it rolled away. Not to let Jesus out, but to let everybody in. So let's take out the wafer to see the resurrection. To God, we thank you. As we come here today, we thank you for the body of Christ. We remember the sacrifice for our sins. We thank you that Jesus freely laid down his life as our king so that we could be forgiven of our sins that we could live under his kingdom authority role. So as we take and we eat this, we do this in the name of Jesus, our King. Let's take and let's eat. So that wasn't the triumphal entry because they didn't truly worship him as king. A few days later, they all get together and they yell out, crucify him. You want me to show you the real triumphal entry? Here's the real one. Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. 
His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on a white horse wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he had a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let's open up the juice. Mm, the king laid down his life, freely laid down his life, shed his blood so that you can be forgiven of all your sins, so that you can come into his kingdom and live free from the authority rule of the world, the flesh, and the devil as we live under his kingdom authority rule. So today, as you look at this juice, just look at it for a moment. And think about what it means to you. The blood of Christ that forgives you of all your sins, past, present, future. And then whenever we take this and we assimilate this into our body, that we are coming under the kingdom authority rule of Jesus and we're praying the very life of Jesus will fill our hearts and our lives. So let's take, let's drink in Jesus' name. All right, so you guys up here at the front may be seated back in your seats. We're about to, the Bible says we are all broken and leaky vessels. And we're about to bring in a broken, leaky vessel. <laughs> that we're going to get baptized in. That's kind of like the procession right here. Look at this. Here comes the baptistry. Thank you, BJ, for moving back the screen. Appreciate that. So why do we baptize? I mean, we were just talking about that a while ago, but what, what is the purpose of baptism? So, so here's the thing. We as a church body, when we experience communion, we're communing with the Lord. It's, it's, we're at the table with the Lord. And then whenever we as a church, when we come together and we celebrate baptism, because that's what this is. When we celebrate baptism, you know, we're talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You know, that's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. And then there's a, there's a symbol of whenever we're going to see Savannah. You know, she's going to go through the, say she's dying to her life, to her, the, her rule over her life, and she's being Buried and then immersed and then resurrected to the a power, the authority rule of Jesus, the power of the, the Holy Spirit, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to change her, to live in that. And what, what a beautiful thing that is right here. So just listen, I'm being careful to try to stay away from that word symbol. Okay? Because although it is a symbol, but we've made it just into a symbol. It's more just like you take in the communion, it's more than a symbol, and this is more than a symbol. It's a reality. It's a life. It's a new beginning. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. So her dad, Ryan, and her grandfather, Keith. This is Rebecca's dad. He's also a pastor. He got the day off today. He told me he was feeling very relaxed. He asked if he could say a few words, and him being Rebecca's dad, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> I'm going to hand him the microphone. <laughs> One of the other reasons that we baptize is because Jesus told us to, so we do it to be obedient. Uh, 
we do it because Jesus did. So we do it to emulate him and his example. And um, we also do it as a testimony of what's happened in our heart. This little girl has four, well, she's seven. And that's young compared to most of us. But in this young little life, she has demonstrated as well as expressed her desire to be obedient. And she wants to follow the example of Christ. And so she wants to be baptized for those reasons, but also as a testimony to all of you here in her church or her church family. So as a, as a preacher, I'm happy for you. And, um, and I'm pleased. But as your grandfather, I'm, I'm proud of you. And, um, and I love you. So I'm going to get to baptize you. I want you to come over here if you would. I want to ask you a question. Okay, Savannah. Do you, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. And have you accepted him? as your Savior, that you will obey Him and trust Him right now and forever the rest of your life? Yes. What was that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I want to baptize you, is because I know what's happened in your heart, and I want us to experience that together. Okay? So I'm going to give this mic back to you. <laughs> so then upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and your commitment to be obedient to him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. Did you need it? <laughs> yeah! Ha, ha, ha.